Welcome to the video lecture on polar coordinates and calculus. Now recall that in the polar coordinate system, the coordinates r, comma, theta represent the directed distance from the pole to the point and the directed angle counterclockwise from the polar axis to the segment from the pole to the point. A polar function would be of the form r equals f of theta. Now to start off with, we're going to learn how to find the slope of the tangent line of a polar graph, and we're going to do that by parameterizing the equation. So if we think of r as equal to f of theta, and we're going to assume that f is a differentiable function of theta, then to parameterize it, we're going to set x equal to r cosine theta, so the r gets replaced by our, by our function f of theta, so x becomes f of theta cosine theta and y is defined to be r sine theta, so if we replace the r with our f of theta, then y becomes f of theta sine theta. So our formula for taking the derivative of parametric equations was dy over dx equals, normally we would say dy over dt divided by dx over dt, but in this case we're actually using thetas instead of t's. So this formula becomes dy over d theta divided by dx over d theta. So here's how you do this. If you want to find the equation of a polar form, you're going to be given a polar equation of the form r equals 2 sine theta. So if we recall that x is equal to r cosine theta and y is equal to r sine theta, then I'm going to substitute in for this r our formula 2 sine theta and it gets multiplied by our cosine theta. So this is the x equation of our parametric equations. And then the y equation, when I replace this r, this becomes 2 sine theta sine theta. And if you want, you can rewrite these. This one is a double angle formula, so if you want, you could write it as sine of 2 theta. And this one, if you want, you could rewrite as 2 sine of theta quantity squared. Now to actually find the derivative, we want to use the formula dy dx equals the derivative of the y with respect to theta divided by the derivative of x with respect to theta. So we need to find these two individual derivatives, dx d theta and dy d theta, and then we're going to divide them. So the derivative of sine 2 theta is going to be 2 cosine 2 theta and the derivative of 2 sine theta quantity squared, when I bring down the 2, this becomes a 4 sine theta to the power 1 times the derivative of sine theta, which is cosine theta. So this becomes, for dy to theta, on top we got 4 sine theta cosine theta, and on the bottom we got 2 cosine 2 theta. And you can reduce that into a 2 sine 2 theta cosine theta, whoops, sorry, 2 sine theta cosine theta over cosine 2 theta, and lots of options here, but if you want, you could change 2 sine theta cosine theta to sine of 2 theta, and that means this is really the same as tangent of 2 theta. Any one of these answers would be correct, okay? So here's our derivative. Now remember that horizontal tangent lines are going to occur for this derivative formula right here when the derivative is zero, and that's going to happen for this fraction when that numerator is zero. So we're going to get horizontal tangent lines when dy d theta is zero, and we want to assume here that the bottom, dx d theta, is not also zero, otherwise we'd get zero over zero. We're going to have vertical tangent lines when this fraction becomes undefined, and that's going to happen when the denominator is zero. So we want to look for when dx d theta is zero, and again, making sure that the top, dy d theta, is not also zero at the same time. So let's find the horizontal tangent lines and vertical tangent lines for this polar form r equals 2 times 1 minus cosine theta, and we're going to sketch the graph as well. So first thing you want to do before you take any derivatives of a polar form is turn it into its parametric form. So remember that x is defined to be r cosine theta, and r is now this formula right here. So this is going to become x equals 2 times 
1 minus cosine theta times cosine theta. If I go ahead and distribute there, I'm going to distribute 2 cosine theta to the 1, so that'll be 2 cosine theta, and then I'm going to distribute 2 cosine theta to the cosine theta, so that'll be 2 cosine squared theta. And then for my y, y is defined to be r sine theta, so when I replace r with this 2 times 1 minus cosine theta times r sine theta and distribute, I'm going to get 2 sine theta minus 2 sine theta cosine theta. Now let's go ahead and look at our derivatives. So dx d theta would be the derivative of 2 cosine theta is negative 2 sine theta, and the derivative of negative 2 cosine squared theta, we bring down the 2 so this turns into a 4, the cosine theta stays put, but the derivative of cosine theta is negative, so this becomes plus sine theta. dy d theta will be the derivative of all of this. Derivative of 2 sine theta is 2 cosine theta. And then the derivative of this product, you're going to have to use your product rule. So we'll have minus 2 sine theta times the derivative of cosine, which is a negative, so this becomes plus sine theta. So this is actually going to become a sine squared. And then we'll have um, plus our cosine theta times the derivative of negative 2 sine theta, which is going to be a negative 2 cosine theta. So cleaned up, this is 2 cosine theta plus 2 sine squared theta minus 2 cosine squared theta. So there's our dx d theta and our dy d theta. So in order to have a vertical tangent line, we're going to look to see where dx d theta, which would be the denominator of our derivative, is 0. So we want to set all of this dx d theta equal to 0 and we want to solve for theta. So the first thing I'm going to do to try and solve this is I'm going to factor out a 2 sine theta since both these terms have that in common. I'll have a negative 1 left here plus a 2 cosine theta. So if I set each of these pieces of the product to 0, this one is going to force me to have sine of theta be 0 and this one is going to force me to have negative 1 plus 2 cosine theta equaling 0, which is the same as cosine of theta equaling to 1 half. So when does theta equal to 0? Well, that's going, when does sine of theta equal to 0? That happens at 0, at pi, and at 2 pi. When does cosine of theta equal to a half? Well, that's going to be at our pi over 3 angles, and we want it to be in quadrant 1, which would be pi over 3, and quadrant 4, which would be 5 pi over 3, since we want positive 1 half. So those are potentially going to be our vertical tangent lines. Over here, we want to find out when our horizontal tangent lines occur. So that's going to require that the numerator of our derivative, which is the dy d theta part, be 0. So we're going to set all of this equal to 0. Now you're probably going to want to use some identities here to help you out. What I might notice is that I've got a cosine here, a cosine squared here, and then I have the sine squared here. What would be nice is to get everything in terms of cosines so that all my trig functions match. So I am going to substitute in for this sine squared 1 minus cosine squared theta. So I'll get 2 cosine theta plus 2 minus 2 cosine squared theta minus 2 cosine squared theta. So combining some like terms, I'm going to get a negative 4 cosine squared theta, a positive 2 cosine theta, and a plus 2. And let's go ahead and um, multiply through, or actually let's go ahead and divide everything through by a negative 2. So that will make this become 2 cosine squared theta minus cosine theta minus 1. And now it should become factorable. So if I factor this, we're going to get a 2 cosine theta 
and a cosine theta, a 1 and a 1, and I need this guy to be minus and this to be plus so that my middle term is negative. So this is going to be 0 when cosine theta equals negative a half, and that's going to happen at our pi over 3 angles in quadrants 2 and 3. So 2 pi over 3 and 4 pi over 3. And this factor is going to be 0 when cosine of theta is 1. And that's going to happen at 0 and 2 pi. So what we want to consider then are where these vertical and tangent line, vertical tangent lines and horizontal tangent lines are going to occur. But keep in mind, you want to know where that dx d theta is 0 and that dy d theta is 0, but we want to make sure that they're not both simultaneously 0. And that's going to happen at 0 and 2 pi since both of these had those as solutions. So I'm going to drop those out as potential tangent lines because we don't want those to both be simultaneously 0. So that means I only need to look at for my vertical tangent lines when theta is pi, when theta is pi over 3, and when theta is 5 pi over 3. And it's nice to know what the um, r values are going to be at these points. So to figure out r, you go back to your original curve up here, and you're going to substitute in your different theta values. So if theta is pi, cosine of pi is negative 1. So this becomes 1 minus a negative 1, which actually becomes a 2, and 2 times 2 is 4. So this first r value will be 4, which means this is the polar point 4 comma pi. Now let's see what happens at pi over 3 and 5 pi over 3. At pi over 3 and 5 pi over 3, cosine is a half. So this becomes 1 minus a half, which is a half, and 2 times a half is 1. So both of these r values are going to be 1. So this is 1 comma pi over 3 and 1 comma 5 pi over 3. Now let's look at these theta values. So when theta is 2 pi over 3 and when theta is 4 pi over 3, what's the r values for those? So when cosine, <coughs> excuse me, when cosine is when the angle theta is 2 pi over 3 or 4 pi over 3, cosine is negative a half. So up here we'd have 1 minus negative a half, which is 1 plus a half, which is 3 halves. 3 halves times 2 is 3. So the r value that we'll get is 3 for both of these. So this is 3 comma 2 pi over 3 and 3 comma 4 pi over 3. So these are going to be our horizontal tangent line points and these are going to be our vertical tangent line points. Now let's verify that these are right by looking at our graph. So the equation r equals 2 times 1 minus cosine theta is the same as r equals 2 minus 2 cosine theta, and that is our equation of a cardioid, that heart shape. It's got a negative cosine in it, so we're going to point to the left, and we're going to, when theta is 0, cosine is 1, so 2 minus 2 will be 0. So this is going to hit right at the pole. When theta is pi over 2, cosine is 0, so this will be 2, so that's up here. When theta is 3 pi over 2, this is also 0, and we go out 2. And when theta is pi, that's negative 1, so we get 2 plus a 2, which would be out 4. So this cardioid pointing to the left is going to look something like this. And in terms of our um, tangent lines, we're going to have 4 comma pi right here, and that's our vertical tangent line. 1 comma pi over 3, which is right about here vertical tangent line, and 1 comma 5 pi over 3, which is about here. So those look right. And then 3 comma 2 pi over 3, that's over here. And then at 4 pi over 3, that's down here. And my drawing abilities, especially on my computer, are not that great. This actually should be a little bit more rounded. You can see the shape better if you verify it on your calculator, but these will actually look more correct like horizontal tangent lines if you can graph it a little better than I did. Okay? Now recall that our formula for the derivative of a function in polar coordinates 
we know that x is equal to r cosine theta, and if we replace that r with f of theta cosine theta, and we change y equals r sine theta into f of theta sine theta, then this derivative formula becomes the derivative of y with, with respect to theta. So using the derivative of this, using the product rule on that, we would get f of theta times the derivative of sine theta, which is cosine theta, plus the derivative of f, which is f prime of theta, times sine of theta. So all I did was the product rule on the y function. Now let's divide this by the product rule of this x function. So that's going to be f of theta times the derivative of cosine theta, which is minus sine, so I'll put a minus in front of that, and then we'll have plus the derivative of f times cosine theta. So this is what our derivative is going to look like. Now look what happens if your r, which is our f of theta, so here r is the same as f of theta, if r is equal to zero, then that means f of theta is equal to zero. So that means this would go to zero and this whole term would go to zero. So what we would be left with is f prime of theta sine theta over f prime of theta cosine theta. These cancel each other out and this just becomes the tangent of theta. So this is called your tangent through the pole. So solutions obtained by setting r equal to zero give equations of tangent lines through the pole because if your r is zero then you're going through the pole. So what we're going to do here is we're going to find the equations of the tangent lines through the pole if r equals to 2 sine theta. So what we just found out is that tangent lines through the pole will occur when your r is 0. So the first place we're going to start is by setting this r equal to 0 and trying to solve this equation. Dividing by 2 just gives me 0 equals sine of 2 theta. So when does that happen? Well you can replace sine of 2 theta with 2 sine theta cosine theta and that's going to be 0 when either sine of theta is 0 or cosine of theta is 0. So sine of theta is 0 at 0 pi 2 pi etc and cosine of theta is 0 at pi over 2 and 3 pi over 2, etc. Now what does the graph of 2 sine 2 theta look like? If you sketch that, that is one of our rows shapes and since the angle here is 2 theta we're actually going to have four leaves and they're going to look something like this. Again, my drawing abilities aren't the best here, especially on my computer, but that's kind of what our graph would look like. So at 0, you're coming into that pole and you're going to get that tangent at the pole. At pi, you're coming in again and getting a tangent at the pole, and at 2 pi as well. So these are all going to give you tangents at the pole. And then at pi over 2, you're coming around and you're coming down and having a tangent at the pole coming down this way. And then at 3 pi over 2, you come around and have another tangent at the pole coming from up above. So we are going to have tangents at the pole at all of our major quadrant axes. Now we've talked about how to find arc length of a rectangular equation. We've talked about how to find arc length for a parametric equation. So now we're going to talk about how to find arc length of a polar equation. So you have two options. The first option is to change your polar curve to its parametric form. And that's the same process that we've been using when we were looking for the derivative. We change x into r cosine theta and replace the r with f of theta. And we replace y with r sine theta and that turns into f of theta sine theta. And then you use the parametric form for the arc length formula which is to take the derivative of x squared plus the derivative of y squared under a square root and integrate that. So that's option number one. 
The second option is there is a specific formula for arc length in polar form, and it looks like this. This would be something you'd have to memorize. Square root of r squared plus dr d theta quantity squared d theta. So if you use this particular formula, you don't have to use the parametric equations at all. And it turns to turn out that this polar form of our arc length tends to give you an integral that's a little bit easier and cleaner to solve. So I would recommend knowing this option. So let's try it out. We want to find the arc length of the curve r equals 4 cosine squared theta over 2. So in order to use this formula, we need to figure out, first of all, some bounds here. And we're going to need to know what r is, which we actually already know. And we're going to need to know dr d theta, which is going to require taking a derivative. So we've got a couple things to do here. First of all, let's take a look at some of our um, theta values. You can look at a graph on your calculator, that's fine, or you can just punch in a few values. If theta is 0, then cosine of 0 is 1, so this is just going to be 4. If theta is pi, then we get cosine squared of pi over 2, which is 0, so this r value goes to 0. And if we use 2 pi, then we're going to be looking at cosine squared of 2 pi over 2, which is cosine of pi. When you square that, that becomes a positive 1 times 4, so we're back to 4 again. So what we can notice is that this curve is um, going through our, um, our shape here from 0 to pi. So we're going through our particular curve over an interval from 0 to pi for our thetas. So if you pull up your calculator, you can see this. Here's my curve, and for my window, initially if I use 0 to 2 pi for my thetas and hit graph, you're going to get almost like this rose kind of shape to it. If you change your window and just look at it from 0 to pi, and hit graph, then you just get the upper half of that rose shape. So it's really your choice here, but I like to use some symmetry if I can. So what I might recommend here is to use bounds from 0 to pi and just double it. And that way we're finding that whole arc length all the way around by just going from 0 to pi. And that way we're not going to get possible issues of things canceling out and getting 0 when we know the answer shouldn't be a 0. So I'm going to use bounds from 0 to pi. Now to fill some things in here, let's go ahead and find dr d theta. So the derivative of this r function, when I bring down that 2, this is going to become 8 cosine of theta over 2 times the derivative of cosine, which is a negative sine of theta over 2, times the derivative of theta over 2, which is a 1 half. So simplify, this becomes a negative 4 cosine theta over 2 sine of theta over 2. You could use a double angle identity there if you want to. I'm just going to leave it as is and see where it leads me. So now we're ready to kind of plug in and see what happens. So this becomes the integral from 0 to pi times 2. The r that we're substituting in is this value right here. So 4 cosine squared theta over 2 quantity squared plus our derivative, which is all this stuff. And we want to square that. So when I square, I'm going to end up with a 16 cosine to the fourth theta over 2 plus negative 4 squared again is a 16 cosine squared theta over 2 times sine squared theta over 2 d theta. Now what I'm going to do is factor out from that integral a 16 cosine squared theta over 2, and that's going to leave me with a cosine squared theta over 2 plus this sine squared theta over 2. And be on the lookout for that. Remember that cosine squared plus sine squared is always 1. So this goes to 1. And the square root of 16 is just 4 and the square root of cosine squared is just cosine. So this 
changes very simply into 4 cosine theta over 2. Now I can pull the 4 out, and then to integrate cosine of theta over 2, you must have the derivative of theta over 2 present in your integral to be able to integrate it. And the derivative of theta over 2 is a 1 half, so I'm missing a 1 half, so I have to counterbalance by a 2. So now this becomes 16, and the integral of cosine is just sine of that angle. And now I'm ready to plug in my bounds. So when I plug in pi, I get sine of pi over 2, which is 1 times 16. And when I plug in 0, sine of 0 is just 0. So this answer is 16, and that's our arc length. Now to find the points of intersection of two polar curves, r equals f of theta and r equals to g of theta, we sometimes have to solve a system of equations. Now because there is not a unique representation for each polar coordinate, we sometimes need to look for alternate forms of each polar equation. An alternate form for a polar equation r equals f of theta can be given by the equation negative 1 to the n r equals f of theta plus n pi. For example, in alternate form for the equation r equals 2 minus sine theta would be negative r equals 2 minus sine of theta plus pi, which is the same as r equals negative 2 minus sine of theta. If you use your addition formula for sine, sine of theta plus pi is the same as sine of theta. So here's what we're going to see you think about this on a circle, if you have on this point right here as r comma theta, then over here when I add pi to that theta, this would be the same r but theta plus pi if I add 180 degrees around. Now this point right here is the same as take, or excuse me, this point over here, r comma theta, is the same as this point but using a negative r. So this point right here is the same as a negative r with theta plus pi. So instead of going this way, we do the negative r which takes us back to here. So that's why these two are equivalent, okay? And that's what this formula is really saying. So let me show you an example of what I mean here. We want to find the points of intersection of r equals 2 sine 2 theta and r equals to 1. So let's do a rough sketch of that. r equals 2 sine theta, 2 sine 2 theta is a rose curve with four petals. So it's going to look something like this. Okay, and then r equals to 1 is just a circle. Now these petals go at a distance of 2, so r equals to 1 would be smaller than that. So it's going to look something like this. So how many points of intersection are there? Well, there's one here, 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 and one here. So there's two, four, six, eight points that we should be en ending up with. So we want to end up with eight different values. So your first instinct to find where two things intersect would be to set them equal to each other. So let's take our 2 sine 2 theta and set it equal to 1. So that's going to happen when sine of 2 theta is equal to a half. So that means we need this angle 2 theta to give us a sine value of a half. And sine is equal to a half at either pi over 6 plus some 2k multiple or that's quadrant 1, or 5 pi over 6, which is quadrant 2. So if I divide everything by 2, then this becomes pi over 12 plus k pi, or 5 pi over 12 plus k pi. And let's write out what some of those thetas are going to be. So if I let k be 0 here, then this would just be pi over 12, and if I let k be 0 here, this is just going to be 5 pi over 12. If I let k be 1, then pi over 12 plus pi is pi over 12 plus 12 pi over 12, so that's 13 pi over 12. And if I let k be 1 here, 5 pi over 12 plus 12 pi over 12 is 17 pi over 12. 
If I let k be 2, then I'm outside of one full revolution. I'm beyond 2 pi. So I'm not going to let k be 2. I'm just going to let k be 0 or 1. Now pi over 12 and 5 pi over 12, both of those are smaller than 6 pi over 12, which is pi over 2. So both of these are in quadrant 1. And 13 pi over 12 and 17 pi over 12 are bigger than pi, bigger than 12 pi over 12. So these are both in quadrant 3. So these are going to generate for us these two points here and these two points here, but that's only four values, and we need eight. So we're missing the other two quadrants. So what we want to do now is figure out a way to find those other values. So that's where using this alternative equation comes into play. Okay? So what we're going to do is we're going to replace our equation r equals 2 sine 2 theta with negative r equals 2 sine 2 theta plus pi. And just as a side note here, sine of 2 theta plus pi is the same as sine of 2 theta plus 2 pi. And a 2 pi multiple of 2 theta is going to give you back the same value. So this is really the same as just sine of 2 theta. So I'm going to replace this with 2 sine of 2 theta. So I'm going to move the negative over to the other side. And here's our alternate form. So now what we want to do is set this r equal to our other r, which was just 1. So now we're going to take negative 2 sine 2 theta, and we're going to set it equal to 1. So that means we need sine of 2 theta to equal negative 1 half. So we need 2 theta to equal the angles where sine is going to hit negative a half, and that's going to be the pi over 6 angles in quadrants 3 and 4. So that would be 7 pi over 6 plus any 2k pi multiple, or 11 pi over 6 plus any 2k pi multiple. And if I divide by 2, this becomes 7 pi over 12 plus k pi, or 11 pi over 12 plus k pi. And now I'm going to let k be 0. So that's going to make this be 7 pi over 12, or it's going to make this one be 11 pi over 12. And both of those are in quadrant 2. And then if I let k be 1, 7 pi over 12 plus 12 pi over 12 is 19 pi over 12. And 11 pi over 12 plus 12 pi over 12 is going to be 23 pi over 12, which is just shy of 2 pi. So both of these are in quadrant 4. So that's how I'm going to get those other two quadrants, by using that alternate form. So let's finalize this. Our thetas that we came up with were all of these pi over 12 angles. So we had pi over 12. We had 5 pi over 12. Those were the quadrant ones. And then in quadrant 2, we had 7 pi over 12 and 11 pi over 12. In quadrant 3, we had 13 pi over 12 and 17 pi over 12. And in quadrant 4, we had 19 pi over 12 and 23 pi over 12. Now to find out the r's that go with these, you can go back to your equation r equals 2 sine 2 theta. And most of these should be r equals to 1, but some of these may be that negative 1. So let's just verify a few of them so that you can get a feel for what I mean. If I plug in pi over 12, 2 times that becomes pi over 6, which is going to give me 2 times a half, which is positive 1. If I plug in 5 pi over 12, this becomes 5 pi over 6, which is also a half. 2 times a half is 1. If I plug in 7 pi over 12, that gives me 7 pi over 6, which is quadrant 3. So that's going to be a negative 1 half times 2, so this will be a negative 1. And 11 pi over 12 gives me 11 pi over 6 when I double it, so that's going to give me a negative 1 as well. And then you get the idea for the rest of these. This will be a positive 1, positive 1, negative 1, negative 1. So these are all of my points right here where I have intersections between our 
two curves. All right, so we've talked about um, a couple of formulas here. We talked about arc length and derivatives. Now we're going to talk about an area formula for polar curves. We have an area formula for our regular rectangular equations. We have an area formula for our parametric equations. Now we need an area formula for our polar equations. So here's what the theorem says. We're going to let f be continuous and non-negative on the interval alpha to beta those are my angles, then the area of the region bounded by the graph of r equals f of theta and the radial lines theta equals alpha and theta equals to beta is given by the formula 1 half times the integral of alpha to beta r squared d theta. And the idea behind this area formula is similar to how we developed the area of rectangular regions by chopping up our area into rectangles and then summing up those rectangles. But in the case of polar formulas, what we're actually going to do is chop up our area into sectors of a circle. Instead of chopping it into rectangles, we're going to use sectors. So for example, if you have some curve like this, polar curve, alpha the angle alpha might look like that radial angle right there and theta equal to beta might be this radial line here. And what we are going to do to calculate this area or this wedge in between is we're going to chop it up into little tiny sort of pie pieces if you will, little sectors. And we're just going to take the area of those sector approximations. And when we do this, we're taking our delta theta and we're chopping up this um, angle distance, so alpha, uh, excuse me, beta minus alpha, and we're chopping it into n different sectors. Now the formula for the area of a sector, this is something that you would have learned in trigonometry, is 1 half r squared theta. So our area approximation would would be here the sum of our n different sectors and the area of each sector would be one half times our r which is going to be our function at different um, input values theta sub i squared so there's our r squared and then our theta is actually going to be this delta theta. Now as you make these little delta thetas get smaller and skinnier and skinnier, then you can eventually turn this into the exact area by taking the limit as these um, thetas get smaller. So we get more and more sectors as we let n go to infinity. And then this formula then becomes the integral. So as you take that limit the approximation becomes exact. So this becomes the integral 1 half times the integral from alpha up to beta of f of theta squared d theta. So that's going to be our area formula, 1 half r squared d theta. So we're going to try and find the area enclosed by r equals 2 minus sine theta. And graphing these is really important because it's really going to help you visualize what's going on, especially as we get into more complicated examples. So the graph of this first one, 2 minus sine theta, this is one of those convex limissons. And if theta is pi over 2, then sine of theta is 1. So this will be 2 minus 1. So this is going to go up to a height of 1. And when theta is 0, sine is 0, so this goes over to 2. When theta is pi, this is 0, so this will go over to 2. And when theta is 3 pi over 2, you get negative 1. And 2 minus a negative 1 is 3, so this goes down to 3. So it's going to look kind of like this. Okay, so we're trying to find the area inside of that shape. So what we're going to do is use our area formula, which is 1 half the integral from alpha to beta of r squared d theta. And this is the r. So we're just going to use this formula plugged in for r. So this is going to be 2 minus sine theta, and we want that r squared d theta. 
We want a one half out front because that's just a part of the formula. And then the bounds here to get this whole shape, we had to go from 0 all the way to 2 pi to trace it out once. So my bounds are going to be from 0 to 2 pi. Now to actually integrate this, we're going to need to FOIL this out. So we'll get 4 minus um, 4 sine theta plus sine squared theta d theta. Remember that for the sine squared theta, we're going to need to replace this with a half angle identity. And this is going to become a 1 half times 1 minus cosine 2 theta d theta. So expanding this out or integrating here, the integral of the 4 goes to 4 theta. This 4 stays put. The integral of sine theta is negative, so this becomes plus cosine theta. If you distribute your 1 half across, this is a 1 half minus 1 half cosine 2 theta. So the integral of the 1 half is just a 1 half theta. And then we're going to get that minus 1 half from out front. And remember that to integrate cosine 2 theta, you can't do that without having a 2 inside. So you have to counterbalance by a 1 half. So we'll get another 1 half from the counterbalancing. And the integral of a cosine is a sine. And that 2 theta stays put. And we want to do this from 0 to 2 pi. So we can do a little bit of combining of some like terms here. We'll get a 4 theta plus a half theta. So that's going to be um, 4 is the same as 8 halves. So this will be 9 halves theta plus 4 cosine theta minus 1 fourth sine of 2 theta. So when I plug in my 2 pi, I'll get 9 halves times 2 pi. The 2's cancel, so this is just 9 pi plus Cosine of 2 pi is 1 times 4 will be 4. 1 half, sorry, I'm looking at the wrong spot here. So that's this part. And then minus 1 fourth sine of 2 times 2 theta would be sine of 4 theta, which goes to 0. So that's for the 2 pi. And now if I plug in the 0, this will go to 0. Cosine of 0 is 1, so we'll actually get another 4 there. And sine of 0 will be 0. So these 4's actually cancel out because this one's plus and this one will be subtracted. So we get 1 half times that 9 pi. So the whole thing is just 9 pi over 2. All right, let's try it again. But this time we want r equals 2 cosine 3 theta. So this is that rose shape. It always helps to draw a picture first. It's a cosine one. And it's an odd, so we're going to have three petals, and they're going to look something like this. They have a length of two. And one thing that is good to notice here is that 2 cosine 3 theta is going to hit zero when your theta is um, pi over 6. So you can make a little chart here if you like. Initially, when theta is zero, Cosine of 0 is 1, so this is 2. So we're starting right at this point. And when I use up the angle theta of pi over 6, 3 times that is going to become pi over 2, and cosine of pi over 2 is 0. So it first hits this pole right here at pi over 6. So from 0 to pi over 6, we're tracing out just the top half of this first petal. Now, why is that useful to know? Well, because it can really help us with our symmetry and calculating the area. We want the area of this whole shape. So what I can do is notice that it has three petals. And if I do my integral from 0 to just that pi over 6, that's just going to give me half the area of one petal. So to get all of these petals, I'm actually going to need 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6 different halves. So I'm going to multiply this by 6. And then in my area integral, remember the formula is 1 half r squared d theta. So this is actually going to become 6 times a half, or 3. And my r 
gets replaced with that formula 2 cosine 3 theta and we want to square that. So use your symmetry here. You don't have to go all the way around, especially when these curves kind of backtrack on themselves and twist around. It's always easiest to find where one of these petals starts and stops and just look at the symmetry to help you get the total area of all of them. Now when I FOIL this out, I'm going to get 2 squared, which is 4, and 4 times 3 will be 12. So I'm going to get a 12 out front, and inside here I'll have a cosine squared 3 theta. Now that's an even power, so I'm going to need to use that half angle identity again. Half of 12 is 6, and we're going to get 1 plus cosine, and remember you double this angle, so if this is a 3 theta, it's going to turn into a 6 theta when I use that half angle identity. So I'm going to have the 6 out front, the integral of 1 becomes a theta. To integrate 6 cosine of 6 theta, you need a 6 in there, so you have to counterbalance by a 1 6, and the integral of cosine is sine. So this becomes 1 6 sine of 6 theta from 0 to pi over 6. So if I plug in pi over 6, this theta becomes pi over 6. 6 times pi over 6 is pi, and sine of pi is 0. Now if I plug in 0, this goes to 0, and sine of 0 is 0. So by using some symmetry here, we're really making these calculations become pretty simple. A lot of things cancel out to 0. And 6 times pi over 6 is just pi. So the area of all three petals is going to equal to pi. Now we want to find the area enclosed by one loop of r squared equals to 2 sine 2 theta. Now this is one of those lemnus gates, so this is going to look kind of like that figure 8 that's sort of tilted like this. And you want to remember that these lemnus gates have sort of a restricted domain because you want your r squared to equal to 2 sine 2 theta, so any time that this sine of 2 theta becomes negative, that can't happen because you can't have r squared equaling a negative. So the domain of this is actually from 0 to pi over 2, quadrant 1, and then um, pi to 3 pi over 2. So if you look at a few values of theta here, just to kind of help you out, what I would recommend doing is seeing if you can figure out what's going to trace once around this very first loop. And then to find the area of both loops, we're just going to double that. So if theta is 0, sine of 0 is 0, so r squared is going to be 0. So that's starting right there at the pole. And now sine of 2 theta is going to be um, have its maximum at um, an angle that's going to make this become pi over 2. So if we use pi over 4 and double that, that becomes pi over 2. Sine of pi over 2 is 1, and 2 times 1 is 2. r squared equals to 2 when r is the square root of 2. So this distance right here is going to be square root of 2. So there's my pi over 4 angle, and this radial distance here is root 2. Now if I let theta be pi over 2, 2 times that makes it become a pi, and sine of pi is 0, and r squared equaling 0 is going to happen at 0. So if I go from 0 to pi over 2, that gets me once around this loop. So that means the bounds that I want to use are going to be from 0 to pi over 2, and I want to double it so that I get both loops. Okay, use your symmetry again. So what do I use for my rest of my formula? Remember we're going to get a 1 half r squared d theta. Well in this problem you already have r squared, so we don't need to square anything. We already have what r squared equals. These cancel and this r squared just gets replaced with 2 sine 2 theta. And we're integrating that from 0 to pi over 2. So this is going to become um, 2 sine 2 theta. In order to integrate this, you need to have the derivative of 2 theta in your integral, which I do. So I don't need to do any counterbalancing. I have all the right pieces. And the integral of sine is negative cosine 2 theta. And we want to use our bounds 0 to pi over 2. So if I plug in 
pi over 2, this becomes negative cosine of pi minus negative cosine of 0. Cosine of pi is negative 1, so minus minus becomes plus 1. These become plus, and cosine of 0 is 1, so the whole thing is 2. Okay, the next example, we want to find the area of the inner loop of r equals 1 minus 2 cosine theta. So if you graph this, this is going to be um, our shape that looks kind of like this. When uh, cosine is 0, or excuse me, when theta is 0, cosine of 0 is 1. So this is going to be um, 1 minus 2 or negative 1. So we're going to be over here. When cosine of pi over 2 goes to 0, this just goes to 1. So we're going to be up here at pi over 2. At pi, we get negative 1. So this becomes 1 plus 2, or 3. And at 3 pi over 2, this goes to 1 again. So this is going to be um, a shape that looks like this. And then you have that little inner loop on the middle. So what we want to figure out here, what's important to know, is when do we trace out this inner loop? Because that's going to help us figure out our bounds. And it's hitting this inner loop when it passes through that pole. So a good place to start is to take your polar equation here and find out when it hits that pole, when it's equal to 0. And that's going to happen when cosine of theta is equal to a half. And that's going to happen at your pi over 3 angles, like pi over 3 and um, 5 pi over 3, things like that. Okay, So what we want to figure out is where exactly we are. So if we make a little table here, at 0, we got negative 1. That was this point over here. So this is right when we're at 0. And when we go to that very first pi over 3, cosine of pi over 3 is a half. 2 times a half is 1. 1 minus 1 will be 0. So this angle right here is going to be that pi over 3 when we come in right here at pi over 3. So to better show you what's going on here, if we zoom in on this graph, at 0 we're starting at negative 1 over here. And at pi over 3, which would be along this radial line, kind of like that, we're coming in around to the pole from the bottom. So it's actually the bottom half of this loop right here. So the area under that curve would be this area right here. And if we want the area of this inner loop, we also want the top half as well. So what we can do for our integral is do the integral from 0 to pi over 3, but since that's only the bottom half of the loop, we can double it to get the full loop. So the bounds that we want to use here are 0 to pi over 3, and we're going to double that to get the whole thing. And then inside of here, we want 1 half times our r squared. So this is going to be the integral that we want to solve. These bounds are the trickiest part of this whole area stuff with all of these polar coordinates. Drawing pictures is super important. Use your calculator to help you out. Make tables of your theta values. Um, it's really going to be helpful for you to get a visual of what's going on. Now these are going to cancel out. So when I FOIL out my integrand here, I'm going to get 1 minus 4 cosine theta plus 4 cosine squared theta d theta. Here you're going to need that half angle identity. So this is going to become 4 times a half times 1 plus cosine 2 theta. So that's going to be 2 times 1, or 2, plus 2 cosine 2 theta. And when I add in these other two pieces, the 1 plus the 2 gives me a 3 minus that 4 cosine theta plus that 2 cosine 2 theta d theta. So the, these are all the things I need to integrate. So the integral of 3 just becomes 3 theta. The integral of cosine is just a sine. We don't have to change the signs around. 
in order to integrate 2 cosine 2 theta, you need to have a 2 in there since that's the derivative of 2 theta. So I already have the 2 there. I don't need to counterbalance. So all I integrate is the cosine function, which becomes sine of that angle. So this just becomes plus sine of 2 theta. And that 2 gets absorbed as part of our du. And now we're ready to use our bounds. When I plug in pi over 3, 3 times that will just be pi. We'll get minus 4 times sine of pi over 3. Sine of pi over 3 is going to be square to 3 over 2. And then 2 pi over 3, that's quadrant 2, so that's also going to be a square to 3 over 2. And then we want to subtract from that 0 plugged in. This will be 0. Sine of 0 is 0. Sine of 2 times 0 is 0. So all of those are 0. So we'll get 4, or excuse me, pi minus 4 times root 3 over 2 is a negative 2 root 3 plus root 3 over 2. So we're going to get um, pi and a negative 4 halves plus a 1 halves is a negative 3 root 3 over 2. As a decimal, that's about 0.5435. All right, the next example here, we're trying to find the area outside of r equals to 2 and inside 4 cosine theta. So we need to draw a picture so we can visualize what's going on here. So r equals to 2 is just a circle with a radius of 2. And 4 cosine theta is a circle with a radius of 2 as well, but it starts at the origin and goes to the right. So it's going to look like this and hit over here at 4, where this hits over here at 2. So we want the area outside of this circle, but inside of this circle. So we're talking about this area right here. Okay. So one key thing that's important to know is obviously going to be this intersection point right here. That's going to have a major impact in our bounds. So to start off with, let's find our intersection point. And to do that, we're just going to set our two equations equal to each other. When I divide by 4, that gives me a 1 half. And in quadrant 1 right here, th cosine of theta equals to a half at an angle of pi over 3. So this is that radial line with theta equal to pi over 3. So let's visualize what we need to do here. If we start with this circle on the outside, the 4 cosine theta, and we integrate that from 0 to pi over 3 where these two intersect, we're going to get this whole wedge, which we don't want. We don't want all of that. But that's where we're going to start. And then what we're going to do with that is we're going to subtract the part of this circle, r equals to 2, that sweeps out from 0 to pi over 3 as well. And we're going to subtract away this stuff in blue, and that should give us this area that we're looking for that's in red. So my strategy here is to start by taking the area of this circle right here, which would be 1 half r squared d theta from 0 to pi over 3. Now that gives me all of this circle all the way, including all of this stuff, which I don't want. So I'm going to subtract from that 1 half r squared, which is now this circle, d theta, and we want to subtract out however much of that circle is swept out from 0 to pi over 3 as well. So we're just subtracting the bigger sector minus the smaller sector to get what's in between. And when I do this from 0 to pi over 3, I'm only getting this top part in blue right here. So to get the full area, we're going to need to multiply this final answer by 2 because we want the top and the bottom piece together. So let's go ahead and see how this is going to simplify. I'm going to have 2 times this 1 half 
times the integral from 0 to pi over 3, 4 cosine theta squared becomes 16 cosine squared theta d theta, minus 1 half the integral from 0 to pi over 3, 2 squared becomes a 4. So let's go ahead and distribute our 2 across. That'll cancel out those 1 halves. And I'm going to pull this 16 out. And then I need to change this cosine squared to its half angle identity. So I'm going to pull out a 1 half and change it to a 1 plus cosine 2 theta. So this is what I have so far. 16 over 2 is 8. And then the integral of 1 becomes a theta. To integrate cosine of 2 theta, I need a 2 in there, which I don't have. So I'm going to have to counterbalance by a 1 half. And the integral of cosine becomes sine of 2 theta. And then the integral of this 4 just becomes 4 theta. So this is 8 theta plus 4 sine 2 theta minus 4 theta. 8 theta minus 4 theta is 4 theta. And now that I have it simplified, I'm going to go ahead and plug in my bounds. So when I plug in pi over 3, I get 4 times pi over 3 plus 4 times sine of 2 pi over 3. Sine of 2 pi over 3 is root 3 over 2. And when I plug in 0, this goes to 0 and sine of 0 is 0. So my answer is going to be 4 pi over 3 plus 2 root 3. And if we um, want, you can get a decimal for that, but I'm just going to leave it in this exact form. So there's my final area of both the top and the bottom halves of that area outside of the r equals 2 circle, but inside of the 4 cosine theta circle. All right, this next example, this one's a tricky one. We want to find the area common to r equals 2 plus 2 sine theta and r equals to 1. So let's draw a picture here. 2 plus 2 sine theta is that cardioid shape. So that's going to look something like this. And then r equals to 1 is a circle that's going to look something like this. So the area that's common to both, which means what's inside both of them, is going to be this region here and here. So the first thing that I would recommend doing is seeing where these two shapes intersect. So that's going to give me these two intersection points. So I'm going to start by setting these two equations equal to each other. So if I subtract the 2 over, I'm going to get a negative 1. And if I divide by 2, I get a negative 1 half. And where does sine of theta equal to negative 1 half? Well, that's going to be at a pi over 6 angle, either in quadrant 3 or quadrant 4. So that could be 7 pi over 6 or 11 pi over 6. Okay. Now, when I look at this in terms of my shape, what we want to realize is that 7 pi over 6 is going to be here, this radial line. And then this radial line over here is the 11 pi over 6. So we need to think of a way that's going to sweep out the area that we're looking for. Now if I sweep out from 7 pi over 6 to 11 pi over 6, I don't want to sweep that out for the circle r equals to 1 because I'm going to get all this extra blue area down here where I don't have anything in common. But if I do sweep out the cardioid from 7 pi over 6 to 11 pi over 6, that's just going to give me this little amount here and this little amount here. And that is part of the common area that I'm looking for. So this stuff that I've shaded in red would be the area integral from 7 pi over 6 to 11 pi over 6, and it would be 1 half r squared d theta. And the r that I want to use is the cardioid equation. So this 2 plus 2 sine theta squared d theta. Now the other part that I want here needs to be this shaded area up here in blue that I have. 
and that is part of the circle um, r equals to 1. Now I don't want to use exactly these bounds because like I said going from 7 pi over 6 to 11 pi over 6 would sweep out this circle going in the counterclockwise direction and it would give me the bottom half of this circle and that's not what I want. What I want is to actually start here and sweep this out from here to here. And I can't quite do that by starting at 11 pi over 6 and going to 7 pi over 6 because those bounds would kind of be backwards. 11 pi over 6 is after 7 pi over 6. So what you can realize is that 11 pi over 6 is equivalent to negative pi over 6. So if I start at negative pi over 6 and sweep out the circle r equals 1 to 7 pi over 6, then that's going to give me this portion of that blue circle from this line to this line. So I'm going to add to this the integral from negative pi over 6 to 7 pi over 6 to get the top half of that circle and I want one half my r which in this case is the 1 squared d theta. So this gives me just those two little humps on the cardioid on the bottom and this gives me the upper half sort of that upside down Pac-Man shape from the circle and the two together give me what they share in common. Okay, So that's really tricky to see and to figure out how to set up correctly. Now that we have the hard part done the rest is just some calculus and doing some integration. So let's go ahead and foil out our 2 plus 2 sine theta. So that's going to become 4 plus 8 sine theta plus 4 sine squared theta d theta. And then over here the 1 squared is just going to stay 1 so this will just be a 1 d theta or d theta from negative pi over 6 to 7 pi over 6. Now as before we have a sine squared in there so we need that half angle identity so this is going to become 4 times a half times 1 minus cosine 2 theta. So this becomes a 2. 2 times 1 is 2 and 2 times our cosine 2 theta looks like that. If I add in these other two terms and combine some like terms 4 plus 2 is 6 so I'll get 6 plus 8 sine theta minus 2 cosine 2 theta and that's what I want to integrate. from 7 pi over 6 to 11 pi over 6. I haven't actually done my integration yet. I have just cleaned it up. So now we're ready to integrate. So I'm going to take one half of the integral of 6 is 6 theta. The integral of 8 sine theta is 8 and then the integral of sine theta is actually going to be a negative cosine theta so I need to change this to a minus sign. And then remember to integrate 2 cosine 2 theta, you need that 2 in there as part of your du because the derivative of 2 theta is 2. So I'm going to use that and absorb it and that means I don't need any counterbalancing factor and that 2 will go away and we'll just integrate cosine which is sine of 2 theta. And the minus sign that we had out front stays put. So we're doing this from 7 pi over 6 to 11 pi over 6. And then this one, the integral of d theta is just theta and we have that one half still out front from negative pi over 6 to 7 pi over 6. If you want you can go ahead and distribute your one half across here. So this would be 3 theta minus 4 cosine theta minus a half sine 2 theta. And then if we plug in our bounds we're going to get 3 times 11 pi over 6. So that'll be actually when I reduce 3 divided into 6 goes in twice. So this will be 11 pi over 2 minus 4 cosine of 11 pi over 6 minus 1 half sine of 2 times 11 pi over 6 is 11 pi over 3 minus if we plug in 7 pi over 6 we're going to get 7 pi over 2 minus 4 cosine 7 pi over 6 minus 1 half sine of 7 pi over 3. And then for this factor here, remember you have different bounds, 
So this is going to be a 1 half, and then I do my 7 pi over 6 plugged in minus my negative pi over 6 plugged in. So this is pretty messy. I would probably just recommend um, using a calculator to get a decimal, but you can definitely find out these different values, 11 pi over 6 and 11 pi over 3 and so forth. That's certainly doable. I'm just going to cut to the chase here and tell you that the decimal is about 2.315. But you could get an exact answer as well. With a little bit of work here, this is going to be 8 pi over 3 minus 7 root 3 over 2. And that would be the exact answer once you figure out these 11 pi over 6's and 11 pi over 3's and so forth. Okay? All right. Our last example here, we want to find the area common to 4 sine theta and r equals 4 cosine theta. So let's draw a picture first. A picture here is key. So 4 sine theta is actually a circle going up and 4 cosine theta is a circle going to the side. So the area common to them is this little piece right here. So what we want to start off by doing is finding out where they intersect each other. So I'm going to set these two equations equal to each other. And I'm going to go ahead and divide by my 4. And that's basically going to be when does sine of theta equal to cosine of theta. And we know that that happens in the first quadrant at pi over 4. So that line is going to cut this right in half, just like that. So what we can do is we can figure out um, some bounds here and figure out what we want to sweep out. And if you look at just this sine, 4 sine theta curve, this circle going up, then from 0, which when theta is 0, this is 0, so we're right at the pole, to pi over 4, that's going to hit at this point right here. So when I sweep out from 0 to pi over 4, I'm sweeping out this part of the circle. So the area that I'm sweeping out is this little wedge right here. So what we can actually do is realize that that's just the bottom half of this common intersection area. So if I double this, that will give me the total area that I'm looking for. And notice that it's not even using or referring to this 4 cosine theta curve at all. We just use that to tell us how far out we need to sweep. But we're not actually going to use this equation in our integral at all because we're just sweeping out the 4 sine theta curve. So the area that we're going to get is going to be the integral from 0 to pi over 4 and we want to double that so that we get both the bottom half and the top half of this little common area. And then I need that 1 half r squared d theta. And the r that we're using is this vertical circle, which has equation 4 sine theta. And I want to square that. So this is all that we have to do to integrate. And we're using symmetry here to, to simplify this. The 2 and the 1 half cancel. 4 squared becomes a 16, which I'm going to go ahead and pull out. And then we're going to be left with sine squared theta, which is, again, a double angle, or excuse me, an even power, so we need our half angle identity. So we're going to pull out a 1 half, and then this becomes 1 minus cosine 2 theta d theta. So 16 halves is 8. The integral of a 1 becomes a theta. To integrate cosine 2 theta, I need a 2 in there, so I have to counterbalance by a 1 half, and the integral of cosine is just sine. And now we're ready to plug in our bounds, and we're going to get pi over 4 minus 1 half times sine of pi over 2, and then we're going to subtract from that 0, and that's going to make both of these be zeros. So we get 8 times pi over 4, and sine of pi over 2 is 1. So when I distribute this 8 across, 8 times pi over 4 is 2 pi, and 8 times a half is minus 4. So we get as our exact answer here, 2 pi minus 4. So you make use of symmetry. Draw these pictures. If you need to use your calculator, definitely do that. Um, find those intersection points, and figuring out the bounds that you need to use is probably the hardest part of all. Alright, that concludes our video lecture on polar coordinates and calculus. Good luck!